grew up in a family that's heavily involved in a white supremacist movement. Uh, they were. Yeah. Now, my parents specifically were not, but like all of my uncles and my grandfather and, uh, you know, like I got the benefit of ha being able to live uh, out it, it kind of in both existences because we would have to be involved with the family because they're the family and their biggest fuck thing is loyalty. Yeah. And if you don't show up when you're supposed to show up, things get bad quick. So like we'd have to go to certain events, you know, like Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, that kind of shit. Oh, I thought it's... you meant white supremacist events. Uh, no. Oh, no. I, feel, See, I was so confused for a second. Then. No. Okay. So like the white supremacy thing, by the time I was a kid, was happening in a very quiet way. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. But it was still, it's still, even now, today, still very, very extremely active yeah. in a community in, in, all, in all of these communities, not just my little farm town in North Carolina, but a hundred, however many tens of thousands of farm towns across the deep South. This is still an, an, an it's, it's an epidemic. It has okay. been going on for some time. Yeah. I, I see no. No, I used to have hope like I guess maybe it was my young teenage brain in the 90s you know yeah. we were we were open we were out and proud and we were happy and most even if your parents or your grandparents didn't agree they kind of gave you the benefit of the doubt or whatever like they weren't most of our friends parents weren't openly hateful about us being whatever we were yeah. right or or whatever but there was still like a lot of conversations that happened like there were a lot of like i i could bring home a gay friend but i couldn't bring home a black friend okay or like shit like that yeah right there were these kind of limits like i could but it was very awkward the energy was off they felt weird i felt weird my parents were very clearly acting weird because they don't know how to deal with a black person in their home or whatever it is you know what i'm saying like yeah it was this and not my mom it was more so my dad but like his energy was really big and so my it kind of like my mom was more of a a lot more progressive fortunately she divorced my dad when I was about 12 um for fortunately for her and and the other kids and stuff now I had to stay behind because if I didn't uh my dad probably would have killed himself <laughs> so I yeah I ended up being in the environment longer than than I wanted now my uncles are I wouldn't want to cross their sociopath yeah um there was and then my grandfather was heavily involved in the kkk when it was active like in the 50s and the 60s he was actually the chaplain clergy oh the kkk they have roles uh yeah okay i'm not um my knowledge on the kkk so, that's that's it there Right. Okay. So the white robes are the soldiers. It's basically set up like a, a form of a Christian mafia. Like you've have ever seen a mafia movie. Yeah. You've got the Don, right? You've got the elders, or if you've ever seen a cult movie, you've got this panel of elders that kind of run everything. And then you have sectors that trickle down. So like, I, if I'm remembering correctly, there are black robes purple robes red robes and white robes and the white robes are the soldiers they're like first in you know infantry okay and that's the that's the majority right yeah and then red robes which is what my grandfather had that represent the clergy the the chaplain who because they lead all of their meetings in prayer okay. like it's it's all very heavily, they, they 100% believe that their interpretation of the King James version of the Bible gives them full authorization from God to eliminate certain subsections of the population, 
like black people and Jews. Oh, like that is legitimately their platform. Okay. So they lead each meeting in prayer and then it, it, after the ritual part, like what everybody sees on TV with them standing around and burning fires and shit, that's just for fun. That's just to get everybody in the zone. That's just for the energy thing. It's like going to a concert or, or any of that. It's getting the mood right. Yeah. But then they sit around and it's like a goddamn council meeting. They call minutes. Who's got the agenda? There's a, there's a budget. There's a, they are highly organized. Who's funding this? Uh, <laughs> everyone, the local oh. community, the church, the local government, the cops. Look, here's the thing. It's kind of like fight club where it's like, we cook your meals. We drive your ambulances. We run your fire trucks. They have learned over long periods, hundreds of years to infiltrate small and large government just enough to stay under the radar, but to run everything that they need to run in their communities. And it all starts with the church. I mean, every single one of my uncles are fucking deacons or whatever the fuck in their local church communities. Yeah. They fleece the church community, these poor communities think, and look, they're great at acting like they're high class Christians and they're just trying to help everyone. And look, sometimes they do, but it's like the mafia or like the cocaine Kings. Yeah. They put a lot of money into the community so that the community backs them and loves them and thinks they're fucking great. Yeah. My dad's funeral was one of the biggest funerals that the County had ever seen. Oh, wow. And now, to be fair, my dad actually really did try to help people, but he had a lot of fucked up ideologies coming out of, in and out of that family that couldn't be handled, couldn't be dealt with. Yeah. I had, I heard and saw way too much fucked up shit growing up, and, you know, and what sucks is then you get this kind of like backlash thing where it's like, you're hearing these things and, and like, or like my uncles or my grandfather laughing about lynching these guys or dragging somebody behind a truck and then ha 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 and then we get in the car and then it's like my parents are immediately on like PR they're like listen that's not how it is anymore don't believe that's some fucked up shit they shouldn't have been doing that but they they would never try to correct them see you don't go against what they're saying you can't it's like they would tell us later on, like, that's a fucked up way to know they shouldn't have been doing that shit. But they would never address it to the people actually saying it. It's, it's like um, it's like teaching, teaching young women to be vigilant of men, but not teaching young men to actually respect young women, which, right. you know, you see, unfortunately, as horrific as it is, it's never a topic that's brought up. Right. And and, and the other thing is, is that it especially where I'm from. See, I'm not anywhere. I, I moved as soon as I, well, once daddy and granddaddy died, there was no reason for me to stay. I was out. Yeah. Um, And that all happened in 2001. So I was like, this, um, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Sorry. no, you're fine. I just like, I couldn't, I was already like half in half out anyways. I was so tired of going to all of their stupid bullshit where it was very clear that like, you know, cause we, when I say I grew up in the church, what I mean is like I said, my uncles were deacons. Uh, my mom was, we were at the church six out of seven days a week. If we weren't at school, we were at church. Yeah. We were, we were cleaning the church or we were getting shit ready for Sunday, or we were practicing for the choir, or we were doing Bible study, or we were doing vacation Bible school, or we, we lived in the church. Absolutely. Lived in the church. And it was so obviously hypocritical. Yeah. I, it, it, to me, even as a small child, like I was the kid getting trouble, getting in trouble in Sunday school, which is like six, seven, eight years old, because you're like, you're too young to be in regular church. You're just going to cause a problem. So why don't you go to Sunday? It was like a babysitting program, basically. Yeah. 
And they would try to half-ass kind of teach little kids about the Bible and stuff. And they would say stuff and I'd be, I'm the kid getting in trouble going, but, but I learned in science yesterday that the world is like millions of years old. And they're like, shut the fuck up. Kind of like, not like, but like in a, like in a nice way, like they would, so, (laughs) and I'm like, you know, so even at like as a small child, I'm over there like, this is insanity. There is a little bit of that, yeah. And it the the hypocrisy is wild, just wild, because it's like they preach all this Jesus, where you're supposed to be kind to everyone and you're supposed to help the poor and you're supposed to all this stuff, but then they turn around and they do the exact fucking opposite. Um, it's a lot of the the people in this community uh, apparently. So they lived on a compound together. Uh, yeah. So okay. Well, <laughs> there was a uh, we called it. I called it the compound. Everybody else called it the farm. So okay. uh there was a farm and I have documents and, and I have seen evidence of, I've seen documents and photographs that put our, my family here, like fucking colonizers. I must like, I've seen personally documents from like before, like revolutionary war times and shit where we were trading with other families and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So we've been here a hot fucking minute. <laughs> uh, I mean, and even when, so I got on Ancestry, you know, everybody gets curious, right? Yeah. And I started looking up family history and all of that. And this was after I had seen documents and stuff in person. And I even have a very large collection of, of documents and photos from a long time ago. Uh, but I'm getting on Ancestry and my mom's, what struck me is my mom's side looks like a family tree, right? It yeah. looks like you got these branches and they come from wherever. And then my dad's side looks like a shrub. <laughs> oh, oh. It's like, I don't have a gene pool. I have a gene puddle. Eesh. You feel me? Yeah. It took a second and then I was like, oh. Yeah. And so I'm looking at it, and so basically there's like eight to 10 last names that kind of just recirculate throughout. <laughs> oh, cool. You just kind of overlap a lot, yeah. right? And then once I saw this, my brain started making sense of a lot of things that I saw and heard over growing up on the, like when we would go to the farm for things like Thanksgiving and Christmas, like, yeah here's a fun story one year I remember being relatively young maybe 10 or 11 right and I'm sitting with my mom and I look at her and I go mom how come aunt so-and-so's with uncle such and such I thought she was uncle what you call it's wife and she goes shh it she is. just kind of quashed it yeah just keep that yeah we just we just don't talk about that we're just, we're just kinda. and then I started realizing that like on the farm all of my cousins look alike no they like all look like oh. the exact same fucking kid yeah like all the girls look like they could be sisters and like all the boys look like they could be brothers and I'm like oh oh that makes sense and then at one point my husband now is a very blonde very pale very blue-eyed dude from like his family hails largely from germany um and when i first met him we were just friends and we were like 15 or 16 he came to my house and i was living with my grandfather at the time and i introduced him to my grandfather and whatnot took like 10 minutes you know and uh, I said, all right, well, we'll see you later, granddaddy. And we went to leave. And he goes, I need to talk to you for a second. And so I was like, well, I'll be right there. And I was like, what you need? And he told me point blank to my face right then at 16. He's like, you can't marry that kid. And I went, 
what are you talking about granddaddy we're just friends like i don't he goes no look you can't marry him he's got the wrong coloring oh because everybody in my family has dark hair yeah and either dark or, or blue or hazel eyes like he was like you can't marry him you'll have the wrong color kids that's what he told me and now i have two very beautiful blonde children <laughs> how, how old how old are your kids i have three 22 17 and 11 do they do they know about your this upbringing absolutely how are they with that they are my children i can 100 percent honestly say are some of the most well-rounded kindest introspective intelligent people i have ever met yeah all of them yeah they go out of their way to help other people for real for not for show yeah <laughs> um they will absolutely stand up for any injustice even if they feel like well they you, might yeah. get in a fight they don't stand up for just themselves see that's the thing is yeah. that there was a defining moment in my life with my grandfather where we were in a restaurant and i was 16 i think because i had driven myself there i might have been 17 but i was still fairly young I knew my grandfather always ate at the same four places. So it was always real easy to find him if I wanted to go have lunch. Right. Yeah. We're sitting in this little country time, hometown, whatever diner place. And he, <laughs> he had his back to the door and it was raining outside. So I could see the parking lot and the door and everything. And it's pouring down rain. And we're sitting in this little restaurant and we're eating our lunch and having grando conversations as you do. And this woman comes in the front door and it dings because it does the ding thing. And it's very obvious that she's getting takeout, that she's just going to walk to the counter. She's going to pay for her shit. She's going to like, it's already on a, in a bag up there on the counter, right? She's going to pay for it. She's going to leave. So during this time, and we live in a small town, so she left her car running and she left the lights on because it's fucking raining outside, right? Yeah. She walks up to the counter. She's trying to interact with the cashier. My grandfather turns and yells i mean not quiet hey you stupid n-word with a hard r oh. you left your fucking lights on yeah. and i couldn't i was like i looked her in the face and i was like I'm so sorry like i just kind of mouthed the words i'm so sorry right before he could turn around to see me because if he saw me apologizing to her, I probably would have got backhanded in that restaurant. And I wouldn't about that life. Yeah. And then I just had to kind of like sink down in my chair. Like, and I just remember feeling so ashamed and helpless and angry and sad and like, fuck and i vowed to myself that day i i don't care never again i don't care who you are i don't care if you're my grandfather or anything i don't care i'm not going to put up with this anymore if i ever hear anything like that out of anybody's mouth again we're gonna fight we're gonna fight i'm over it i'm not yeah it's just such a bullshit bully fucking thing to do and i won't so I got in a lot of fights. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes I think sometimes you need to. Yeah. Like that that's we, the thing. We all have to be willing to because here's the thing. You cannot debate 
hate. There's no logical, you're, you're not going to have a polite conversation that results in less hate nine times out of 10. No. And if we're not all willing to like, bitch, fight me. <laughs> this is it. At some point, we end up like now, where where celebrities with giant public platforms can say some fucking dumb shit. No? Okay. It's not okay. No. Because I'm telling you right now, that's fast tracking it. And that they, makes these people that already are hiding in our communities feel like they are in their their that behavior is enabling people that like my family to feel like they can be more out well, with this, their hate. This is it. So after the after the Will Smith Chris Rock slap people comedians started getting attacked on stage doing doing their job because they on the biggest platform on the planet they've now seen that actually no one's going to stop you no one's going right. to do anything and he's doing right. a, he's doing his fucking job of just being funny and now people are getting attacked a man recently somebody tried to dave Chappelle and got absolutely kicked them but then it keeps happening because right. yeah, and it's it's so stupid. The thing is with celebrities is what annoys me. Boy George chained somebody to a radiator, chained somebody, chained chained him to a radiator, and now he's on TV being praised. Everyone's like, "Oh my god, that was years ago. It's fine." No, he chained him to a fucking radiator. This man was scared for his life. Right. And we're sitting there looking back, talking to family members. Like, he's so lovely. Right. So I'm, and I know. That, that, see, that's it. There's this, and there's this fine line that has to be walked with things like cancel culture, right? Because yeah. Yeah. the reality is, is like, I really feel like the, well, that's just how it was when they were growing up argument is problematic. Like, yeah. okay, but like at some point we all learn and grow. And, you know, there's like a point where personal education needs to fucking happen. And maybe it needs to happen at the hands of somebody else going, hey, motherfucker, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, however, cancel culture in itself is also problematic because the sad reality is that that statement is also paradoxically true. Like if you go back and you look at old television or you look at old movies or you read old books, it was very natural to the current trend of society to like low key slap your wife around or at yeah. least make jokes about it or yeah. what you see what I'm saying. So there is this, there is this kind of paradox between letting sh shit go that should be let go and then holding on to shit that is you know, like Hemingway, piece of shit, right? <laughs> but like, don't throw away grapes of wrath or what? Like, you know, <laughs> Lewis Carroll, giant piece of shit. Alice in Wonderland, my favorite shit. You know, I mean, like, yeah. so there should be, there should be, there's a middle ground where people should be allowed to, obviously, I'm not saying, look, he committed a crime 10, 15 years ago. He shouldn't be. He paid his price, so what, so what. But there is a level where if you don't learn and grow and become a better person, but there's a level where you are just still a... You're just a piece of shit. Yeah, 100%. You're, like, you're just a piece of shit. Like, and here's the reality. The sad reality of it is we're all human beings that have the absolute 100% freedom on this planet to be a giant fucking asshole piece of shit. And we all are sometimes, like yeah. le legit, all right? are. Uh, I mean, ask my kids. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. And I, I, I have, I have this, this thing. I, it's really bad. And I ha like, you open the door for someone, they walk through. Oh, thank you. No worries. I have got this thing in my head where if I move out the way or I do something, and they, they ignore me, I'm like, you're welcome. Like I immediately right. go into fight mode, and I have no idea why I do it. Because I'm a, I'm five foot tall. I'm not fighting anyone. Like, but it's my brain's way of being like, what the fuck? Yeah, like, 
but at the same time, I don't know. There's like I mean well. Do you know what I mean? Like I like right. that's the thing. But yeah, we are all dicks sometimes. It's it's in human nature, but I think there's a level of being a dick and being a disgraceful human being. See, my thing is it's like when I'm a dick, I'm trying to teach you something. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's actually do you know what? That's a much better way of doing it. I get that. I really do. Like, I'm not being a dick because I'm just a fucking asshole. I'm being a dick because you're you're not aware of the fact that you're kind of being a fucking asshole right now. So yeah. Kind of, hey, pay attention. There's a like it's not. <laughs> there's a thing. There's a thing that we do. Um, so uh, where our box and we had a young lad that's 18 years old sparring these these women and trying to take their heads off, like genuinely throwing big right. hooks over right. hands. And being right. like, what the fuck are you doing? There's a level where pe- the other guys, I, I know a guy that's like, right, don't worry about it. I got this. Starts sparring him, right. puts his hands down, lets him throw shots, just slipping shots. Right. Uh-huh. Starts really fucking with him, getting in his head. Right. His mouth guards out. You're not going to like literally right. popping shots. There you go. And he's like, in the end, he hits the kid over the top. And the kid doesn't know idea what's going on. Because the, right. the, the, the woman that he sparred went, no, 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 he's up, he's up, he's up. And he overhanded it. Right. So that's what this guy did. So he overhanded him. And the kid goes, no, he's up, he's up, he's up. Nah, nah, no. mother, like, you fucker, this is it. And it's called a check. Yeah. And sometimes you have to be a dick. Because that if if they hadn't have done that, that kid would have kept doing it. Right. I had this idea for a for a gym <laughs> where if you're if you're if you're acting like a dick, if you're rude to people, the entire gym should be allowed to line up and everyone get a single slap. Like an airplane. Just yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just every single person. Just right. My. Oh. oh, you get checks and you don't like it. Get the fuck out. hundred percent. We had a, we had a guy that come up to one of our girls and he's like, are you single? She's like, oh yeah, but I'm not really looking. Well, you're a lesbian. No, no, I just not, I'm not interested. Like, and he's like, why? She said, no. Right. <laughs> we, sh- I think the second that happened, line up. Ah, okay. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, I guess he's been a dick. Yeah, let's let's get him. But, well, uh, to be fair, all my my children were homeschooled. Yeah. Um, I and unschooled even, which means they got to do whatever the fuck they wanted, and they learned because they learned how to read because they wanted to fucking play their video games and read their comic books by themselves. And yeah. I'm like, well, that's because this word is this, and they're like, okay. And not one time did I ever talk to these kids like, oh. Smooth, little baby. No, I was like, I, even when they were babies, I go in there. I'm like, why the fuck are you crying? <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> uh, you know. And they hung out with me all the time, and they learned what life is instead of I don't know, but stupid this, trivia question answers and the the trivial clicky bullshit that happens in school. That all just... that peer pressure bullshit, none of that happens. My kids have never won, and they're always the ones in their friend because they have giant groups of friends still, mm. and most of their friends go to school. Yeah, and it's funny because my my kids are the ones sitting around with all the other kids going, "Well, that's fucking stupid." <laughs> like, what the fuck did you do that for? Sometimes you know, like you need that. You need that person to turn around and go, "Why did you do that?" And they're always like, well, no, because because it gets very teen drama with school children. Yeah. And my kids were never they just weren't about any of that. They never got, when we would watch that shit on television, I'm, I would be like, see that shit? That's some bullshit. Don't fucking do that shit. If you got <laughs> something to say to somebody, you fucking say it. Don't be playing these stupid games where you're trying to, oh, well, I'll make him think he likes me. So that uh, what if you like somebody be like, hey, you're cool. You want to do some shit? I mean, it's that fucking simple. Like, you yeah. don't have to play these stupid bullshit games. This is some bullshit. And so my kids are just, they're like little shrunken down adults. <laughs> <laughs> Was there um, any backlash when you decided not to engage with the community as an adult? Uh, once my dad and my grandfather died and I left the community, most of them, see- I went no contact and none of them really cared enough to try. Oh, so is it, how has this affected you in your, your adult life? Huh. Huh. I have a uh, severe PTSD. Uh, there's a lot of memories I would 
would just rather not fucking have. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of like weird, um, uh, there was physical abuse, not from inside my family, uh, but just due to the fact that I wasn't really taught well how to recognize and or avoid that kind of abuse. Yeah. Because it was rampantly happening inside my family. So even though I wasn't subjected to it inside the family, it definitely leaked its nefarious <laughs> tentacles into my teen and, and young 20 years without yeah. having any real um real knowledge of what a what a what a healthy relationship looks like is a big deal it wasn't until I met my well I met my husband when we were 16 but we didn't get together until after I had gotten married and and had a my first child and so like there was a lot that went down in between him like him and I we finally got together I think when I was 20 22 or 23 and he's been He's just, he grew up in a healthy childhood. Like he had a healthy childhood. And so he's real even kill and he's, he understands, like he gives me a lot of patience. Like if I hadn't have met him, my life would probably still be complete fucking chaos. Cause I didn't know any different. I didn't know any better. It's, um, it's a bizarre situation when you're, when you're raised in, in a situation where certain Thing, like things are done a certain way and I had a very very good friend who <sighs> the the family home life situation was as vastly different as possible and I was round at Christmas and they were ra- unwrapping presents and taking it one by one by one and everyone was watching each other and everyone was being so civilized and friendly and I'm like this is amazing. This is right. a bizarre. No one's fighting. Right. <laughs> there's no screaming. There's no. Right. Yeah. And people how aren't you... throwing shit at each other. Like yeah. I don't have to low crawl under a giant <laughs> cloud of tobacco smoke for 20 minutes to yeah. get to the bathroom. Like this is great. Now, I mean, fortunately, I did end up with friends who had more healthy. Like I did end up getting like some uh viewpoints outside of what it was like to live in such insanity um yeah. but there were things about see the the other part about it is my family history is so deeply rooted in tradition and loyalty that like even at my age growing up I, like I still even now I have uh spinal problems from where I was never allowed to even kind of relax into a natural stance. I had to stand with my head up, my chin, my shoulders back. I had to pull my stomach up towards my chest. I had to keep my knees together. I had like, I like literally had to walk around as a child with a book on my head um, to, to, to maintain this upright posture. I was, um, my dad had a tradition of every day I would have to open this giant dictionary. I still have it, by the way. And I would have to memorize the meaning of some random word. Okay. Um, there were all these kind of like weird little things that he felt like he was doing to, to help me on some level. But it was just like low-key traumatizing the whole time. <laughs> Were these traditions he was raised in? I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, I don't have a lot of information about his childhood because he wouldn't talk about it to me, and I only have what little he said to my mom. Um, my grandparents, his parents, were divorced at when even my mom met him. In fact, when she met my dad at fourteen, he was eighteen. This was in the late 60s or maybe the 70s no it had to be in the 70s and he my mom thought his dad was dead like she didn't know for a year that my grandfather even existed 
Oh, wow. uh, my grandfather at that point was an alcoholic who was living in a motel. Like he would week to week in a motel somewhere by this point. Um, he beat my grandmother and my dad and his brothers because he was he was an abusive alcoholic who honestly was super pissed off that he contracted tuberculosis in World War II and got sent home before he could kill a bunch of people. Oh, well, I mean, and the only reason I know that is because the paradox of all of this is that when I was growing up, my grandfather was one of the nicest people to me. Like okay. out of all of my family, he was the only one who never yelled at me. He would always help me if I had a problem and it didn't matter if I was in trouble. He was never like, God damn it. What did you do? Like my parents were always like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, even if it was, I just need help with something. It was like, it's my fucking problem, right? Like, why are you bothering me? And he was always the one who was like, I got you. I'll come get you. What do you need? You need some money. You need a place to stay. You know, like he always treated me personally, like the best person on the planet. Like we yeah. had the greatest relationship, but then he'd sit around and talk about all these horrible things or he'd treat like he had all these horrible ideologies. Right. Yeah. And so it was this kind of paradox of like, he's a giant ass evil motherfucker, but he loves me. But this is the thing I've been like, you sit with, uh, so I've been studying um, the, have you heard of the book in broad daylight? I haven't yet. No. So, so Ken McElroy, who was so evil in his life that he was shot by 50, shot in front of 50 witnesses by three high powered rifles. One of those witnesses was the sheriff. And when the police rolled or FBI rolled into town, they went 50 people didn't see a thing. Right. Didn't see a thing. Nope. No free rifles. Didn't see it. But yeah, his family professed till the end that he was the nicest guy they'd ever met. Rapist, right? Violent thief, yeah. yeah. Oh, the best dad you could ever ask for, right? See, that's what's fucked up. Is like he was a horrible dad to my 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 dad and his brothers. He was a horrible husband to my grandmother. He was horrible to just about anyone. Like he, there was, but there was a handful of people that he was like, "You're cool," yeah. and <laughs> you know. So it is kind of like I, and that's part of what I struggle with like in therapy a lot is like trying to deal with these feelings of like because I like at the end I my dad was struggling because my mom had left and my dad was really the only person doing well real good well checks and stuff on my grandfather like my other uncles would go down there sometimes if something was necessary but my dad was really the only one kind of trying to help take care of my grandfather. And then when my dad couldn't, cause he was too depressed, I, I kind of became my response. I even moved in with my grandfather at one point, um, just to help him like cook his meals and keep his house and make sure he had his medicine and all this stuff. And so it is kind of this, and there are so many sweet moments in taking care of him and so many times that he was just my saving grace and in a lot of things but then knowing all of how deep down he was he was an evil person deep down he's he would he'd cut someone rather than anything yeah. do you see what i'm saying yeah like if so. you crossed him if you if, if you looked at him wrong he could kill you and it wouldn't hurt his feelings but he was super nice to me so it's like it's <laughs> it's crazy right it is it's really fucking wild it's and it's uh it's hard to wrap your head around sometimes yeah um do you ever see flashes of that person like oh oh for real yeah oh yeah and then All the time. you see you see a flash of a person and and then the next moment everything's okay 
and it becomes really weird to to figure out the two. I had a I had an uncle, a violent alcoholic. You know the the whole the fun stuff, right? And you would see flashes of of pure rage, and you, you're in a moment where you think, "Fuck, I might die," right? And then the next moment, it's like, "Is everything okay? You all right? You look a bit, you look right. a bit, and you're like, oh, f- <laughs> right." And uh, yeah, like it. I understand that you are t- you are going through therapy to process this. Oh, I've been in therapy my whole life. <laughs> what made you start? Uh, d- say again. What made you start therapy? Uh, I mean, my mom. <laughs> oh, she she actually. I think I, think I was. I was like 11 or 12 when I first started. Oh, wow. What, can I ask what was that like? I was, I mean, I had some decent therapists. I had some shitty ones. What's what's the, because I, I, had, I had quite a bit of therapy as a kid and I had, I had some really good ones. But I had mm-hmm. weird ones. I never had mm-hmm. shitty. I had weird. I had a woman that tried to cover me in coats and get me to go to sleep, which now I'm a little bit older. I think about and I'm like, mm. that's. Yeah, that's not okay. And like another one that gave me, she gave me finger puppets and she's like, I want you to act out your emotions. And I remember right. holding these puppets and thinking, I'm not doing this. Right. This is fucking weird. This is fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had some good ones. I had one, I had, I remember distinctly, I think I was like 13 or 14 and I had this one guy who was so ridiculously bad at it. Like, I just don't even remember specifically how, but I just remember being like, how can you be this shitty at your job? Cause like <laughs> I've been in therapy for two, three years now yeah. and you fucking suck at this. And I, and I'm a 13 year old kid who doesn't give two fucks. So I told him point blank to his face. I was like, you fucking suck at this. <laughs> like, is this seriously what you do for a living? Damn. Like I kind of thought about being a therapist at some point, but if this is what it's like, then God damn it. You made me rethink my entire career plan. You are you are spectacular at this. Like, uh, I, you yeah, know, I'm, that, I'm sure it fucking <laughs> sticking a burn, but whatever. I wonder what he's doing now. I wonder no, if he's no. still doing he's therapy. Probably right. dead. <laughs> he was pretty old then. Oh shit! <laughs> <I was> yeah. Twelve. <12. laughs> I mean, you know, thirteen. It's really bad as well when you like processing. There's there's people in certain situations like that that are meant to help you and. Oftentimes. And they are, oh, they're not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had some really, I've read, and a lot of times, like, well, through my 20s, it was more psych appointments instead of therapist appointments because they just threw you on a bunch of drugs. Yeah. They're just like, oh, here, take these 15 things, <laughs> uppers, downers. No, I could show you a list that would oh, fucking sh- blow your mind. Yeah. But the, the opioid crisis in America, that wasn't just opioids. It was a highly organized over prescription. Like I was on, no, hear me, ridiculous amounts because I have a chronic pain disorder from the PTSD. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was on me at the same weight right? Like I'm not a big person. Okay. Five, seven. Uh, I am like 140 pounds. I don't know what that translates to and stone or whatever the fuck it is you guys use over there. Uh, so we and do, we do, I do kilos because of boxing. Kilos. Yeah. So, uh, right. Uh, I don't know what the difference is in, in pounds. I don't either. I'm going to find so, out one second. But I'm not, I'm not a huge person. Right. Okay. That my point is like, I'm not. Yeah. They had me on 40 milligrams of Oxycontin oh. twice a day, plus 10 325 Percocets, which are 10 milligram Percocets with 325 milligrams of acetaminophen yeah. three times a day for breakthrough pain. In the morning, I would get up, I would take 25 milligrams of Adderall with oh. those pain meds. Yeah. I had to half that in the afternoon. I was also on clonopin. Oh. uh, Bilify, which is a mood stabilizer. And hold on, something else. A muscle relaxer, cyclobenzaphrine. And then at night, they had me on a tranquilizer, either Seroquel or Trazodone. So were you basically like that scene in Wolf of Wall Street when uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is trying to get out of the... (laughs) <laughs> just like crawling everywhere i mean 
I have friends who were legitimately concerned for my mental, for like my whole physical state of being. They're like, I don't even know how you manage. A lot of them said they didn't know how I managed to. Yeah. And I just fucking roll with it, I guess. Wow. I bet you were the most chilled out person anywhere you went though, right? Most time. I was like, fuck it. You know? But a lot of it is like, I have, I have full ass blocks of time that I don't remember. Well, I mean, yeah, that's not. Right. That's, that, so like, know. I mean, I'll have friends of mine be like, come up to me. Remember that time we spent three days, blah, 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 blah. And we rode all over the mountains and we were doing all that shit. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Jeez. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, that'll do it. I'm like, I got nothing on it. And then they're showing me photos of me. And I'm like, ah, what's up? And I'm like, I, I got nothing on this. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's brutal. And what's extra fucked is that I was the one who woke up one morning, looked at my bedside table with all my fucking pills on it from all the doctors. And I looked at the table and I went, fuck that. And I swept every bit of that shit into a, a grocery bag and yeah. I tied it up and I threw it in the back of my closet and I looked at my husband and I said the next two weeks are gonna suck <laughs> yeah oh I bet. And he was and he went whatever you need to do baby let me know and th- look I was not a I was I'm pretty sure I got real close to having a psychotic break you can't just fucking come off like shit like hydrocodones and benzos without like fucking st- you're supposed to step that shit down <laughs> yeah and i just fucking threw that shit in the back of a clock i was legitimately psychotic for like two straight weeks i'm up i'm down i can't sit i can't lay down all right like i was just wandering the house making laps and like fucking doing random shit and my husband's like just sit down and i'm like i fucking can't you know <laughs> yeah i mean it was brutal Jesus. How, it was how- brutal how are you now? I mean, obviously, I know you're still processing, but I mean, I, like, right? I mean, like, I no drugs. I don't do any prescriptions. I take a couple supplements, just like nutrients, you know, like vitamin D and potassium yeah. and shit. Uh, but I don't, I don't have. I have a therapist, but he's more like a. He's more like um, he's a counselor, but he's he does a lot of Eastern medicine. So like I go in and sometimes I get an acupuncture treatment and sometimes we do gua sha or sometimes like, so there's a lot of like different, I have a giant toolbox of things that I can do now that are not drug related that help me manage everything from the pain to the PTSD. I mean, some days are worse than others, but do you, um, do you do any sports? I uh, dance. Okay. I've uh, I've got a small dance studio in my house. Mm. How'd you get into that? Uh, when I was 18, I worked several jobs by this point because um, I had been living on my own as soon as I got my driver's license. Um, so one of my jobs was I worked nights at a hotel so there's nothing to do everybody's sleeping you got like maybe an hour and a half worth of paperwork and shit but there's not much else to do you're just kind of sitting around but they always had two of us on staff well I was 18 and the other guy that worked nights with me was I think at the time 42 or something but he had been a ballroom dance instructor his whole life okay And so for an entire year, I spent nights learning ballroom. Oh, wow. Everything from rumba to salsa to the shag to like all these different dances, uh, swing, like we just, cause I just was good at it. I had always grown up kind of like running around and being on my bike and always kind of really active, you know? And so it helped me stay loose, limber, muscular, and it's it's just a great way to stay in shape, and it's super fun. And then we would go out on the weekends, me and him, just very platonic. He was never, never overstepped his bounds, more like a 
just a fun older father figure kind of friends, like an older brother and uncle who just gave a shit. And we would go out to dance clubs on the weekends and fucking wow everyone. Oh, wow. Right? Because yeah. it was like watching Dirty Dancing or whatever. Like, we could just get out there and fucking kill it. Because all we would do all night is practice dance. And so after I left that job to do other things, I just never gave it up. That's amazing. And now I have a small dance studio with a, I have a parquet floor and then a, a ballet bar and a, and a dance pole and, a, you know, and I just, that's how I stay in shape. So it's, it's, it's one of the, I think one of the best ways of doing it. Like I always from, so I, I uh, started coaching boxing a few years ago and I found that the best people to transition over were always dancers or basketball players. Right. Because you always had the the best the best level of fitness, best coordination. Just there's something that translates in those two those two sports, whether it's I don't know if it's the footwork or if it's just the mentality, but something always translated better than anything. At footballers, for the life of me, I could not could not get a <laughs> thing slight or uh, you know just at all. Right. Rugby players, it's hit or miss. Right. Dance has always been, and I tried to take up dance myself. I tried to take up ballet. And uh, because I was told that's a hard one to start with. Like, I wouldn't recommend if you're trying to get into dance, I definitely wouldn't start there. Uh, Ballet and ballet and toe uh, work were were the parts of dance that I did not get into until I was well in to uh, having a dancer's body by that point. It it is. I made it through the door. Yeah. Yeah. Even now, I, and I have toe shoes, and I, and I, you know, but my ballet bar is more for the limberness and and doing the stretches. Yeah, uh, uh, but the toe work is still even now. It's like when I want to be in pain, like oh, I'm having a masochist day. I'm gonna put my toe shoes on. Yeah, no, uh, I made it to the door. I was eleven, and these girls filled with girls, and every single one of them looked at me like, "What are you doing here?" And I was yeah. like, "Wrong building." Never mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, just turned around, never went back, and I always regretted yeah. that. So what would you recommend uh, if I'm going to start? I don't know if I'm too oh, old for it now. Um, honestly, start with a little bit of music theory because oh. whatever you're, what are you like, whatever music you're into, you, have you ever seen a keyboard, like a uh, an electric keyboard? Yes. Right? yes. Okay. And you know how it's got all the different little settings at the top where it's like rumba, rock, pop, yeah. sync, whatever. Okay. The reason it has those is because literally every single song on the planet falls into one of those categories. It has a very specific algorithm to it, if you will. Okay. If you look at notes, music notes like numbers, that's why those settings exist on the keyboard. So whatever kind of music you're into, you can find the algorithm of those beats and then look up the dance, like, cause doing the samba i can do the samba to almost any modern song even right now as long as it's got a samba beat yeah you see what i'm saying so like i don't have to have a song that was written it's just you learn to focus like oh that's a rumba that's a rumba beat or that's a that's a hip-hop beat or that's you see what i'm saying so like it depends on what music you like because you're not going to dance to something you don't like yeah, like it's true. the dance starts with a feeling Dude. and then my first thing would be like if you want to dance don't study that move your goddamn body <laughs> pick a song you like yeah and move your ass around Joe you don't have to you don't have to be good at dance for dance to be beneficial for you it's something you should do out of joy i dance like all the time but poorly like i'm fully aware i'm the king of dad dancing but Fine. like <laughs> but get on it it's one if of those you're... and look dad dancing right like mm. try that try the, the do like um i a rumba is probably less intimidating than a salsa because you don't have to really get that hip yeah i did a zumba class and they uh, <laughs> you know i got savaged our... even just like <laughs> Even just like old school chorus step dancing, kind yeah. of like think um, uh, dancing in the rain. 
kind of shit. Oh, that's gives cool. you gives you the coordination of the rhythm, and it's it's slow enough, you know, for you to like, you know, you watch TikTok dancers, and you're like, fuck you. I don't, <laughs> what are you? How? You know. But if you start with like old school dance you know and then kind of progress forward through it it makes it much simpler you if you would... really care about being kind of technical oh, we're gonna have to wrap up very soon oh fair enough but it it has been an absolute pleasure i do want to ask just a couple more questions before we are done sure. so if we don't make it then we'll yeah we'll wrap it up how are you now after all that how are you now i great i my husband and i lee have a very successful lifestyle our children are happy and healthy i couldn't ask for anything more in my life i'm so glad to be non-contact with all of that side of my family and they've never tried to to get in touch no no i wouldn't go back there even if i had to (laughs) and they don't try to contact me yeah so when I have- go home to see my mom, who's the only person that lives even remotely close to there, I don't go anywhere near um, the homestead or the farm or even my old neighborhood. You never tempted to drive through and just have a look at the old, or does it not? Oh no, no, no you don't. Dr- you don't drive through the old neighborhood, my child. No, no. Oh, you it's, don't, like, it's like it's like, like they know. Yeah, they'd be it, as soon as I turn down the road, there'd be people stepping out on their porches, going, "Who the fuck is this?" Oh, it's like that. It's like that. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what's your plan for the future now? Keep on keeping on. Um, punch Nazis. I like it. If you happen to punch a Nazi, mm. anytime soon. And I feel like I want to get involved somehow because <laughs> <laughs> I, I can get on board with that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you do give them a, give them a kick for me. And if I can, if I can help, then I don't okay. know. How, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to get involved. I need like a drone or something with a big fist on it. Here's the thing. What you can do is any, and it doesn't have to be just Nazism, fascism or racism. If you see injustice happening in your presence, fucking put a stop to that shit yeah. and because here's the thing as soon as you start other people will join most people are just afraid to take the first action all it takes is one to go fuck you that's some bullshit and then everybody else is like you know what that is some bullshit fuck you right like yeah be the fuck you guy honestly we, we need a um we need an entire podcast just dedicated to saying fuck you to ourselves that's a hundred percent just Anyone that's done some shit recently, Kanye West, whatever the whatever the fuck he's got going on. Right. You're a piece of shit. Fuck that guy. You're a giant piece of shit. 